working. Let me commend all of you who are involved, not only with these two chapters of SABRE, but really the, the chapters of SABRE all over the country, because the work that you all do and the love and interest that you have in this game is so vitally important and, and it's really important and, and certainly greatly appreciated by this museum. And, and so to have this opportunity is something that uh, I, I'm very appreciative of. For me, it started, as you mentioned, Zach, man, 27 years ago. And, and time really does fly. I, I started here at the museum, believe it or not, as a volunteer. Who knew? Who knew? You know, there is no way to know. Uh, it became a labor of love for me. It really did from day one. And, and the interesting thing about it, y'all, was that I considered myself to be a baseball fan. And, and all of a sudden, I'm being introduced to this entire chapter of baseball in American history that I really did not know anything about. Yeah, I knew the names Satchel Page and Cool Papa Bell and Josh Gibson. Those are transformative names. They transition. Most baseball fans have at least heard those names. Now, they may not know how great these guys really were, but they heard the names. But I had no idea about the breadth, the scope, the magnitude of what this history represented, both on and off the field, and, and quite frankly, I just became enamored in it. I became engrossed in it. I wanted to learn as much as I could learn. And Zach, I didn't want to keep it to myself. I wanted everybody <laughs> else to feel the same way I felt about it. And then I started to meet the players, particularly my dear friend, the late great John Jordan Buck O'Neill. And as I tell people all the time, once you're bitten by the buck bug, it's a wrap, man. You just <laughs> want to be on Buck's team. And, and the charisma and the passion that he had for this story that he helped make and this museum that he helped originate. And it was just infectious. And, and so that kind of took me down this journey. I never saw this turning into a career opportunity. I just wanted to be involved. I wanted to support this organization as much as I could. So going back to 1993, I'm working for the Kansas City Star. And I'm working in the Star's promotions department, which functioned as its in-house advertising agency. And as fate would have it, I drew the assignment of promoting the museum's first ever traveling exhibition, an exhibition called Discover Greatness. As a matter of fact, it is still touring the country today. It's at the Yogi Berra Museum right now and was playing to rave reviews before the coronavirus pandemic shut it down. And, and, and so we had that exhibit featured in a storefront space right across the street from where my office is now. And it debuted there in August of 1993. And the campaign that I put together drew some 10,000 people in the month of August to come and see this traveling exhibition. And I think then the officials here at the museum realized that we very much had something that was pretty special. And that is what ultimately prompted them to ask me to join their board of directors, which I proudly did and served in that capacity in a volunteer capacity for five years, doing a lot of the marketing, PR, advertising, community relation things for the museum. I stepped off the board in 1998 to become the museum's first ever director of marketing and you know, took that leap of faith, walked away from my corporate job to come and do this for this fledgling not-for-profit organization. And outside of a brief period where I left in 2010 to take on another role, I haven't looked back since. You know, and so 13 months later, I'm coming back to the museum and they announced me as president. Now I have to tell you, when I left, they gave me this big party. They gave me all these parting gifts. And then 13 months later, here I come back and I'm wondering, are they gonna ask me for my gifts back? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and, and honestly, we haven't looked back since. So now I'm so proud of 
the affiliation that I've had with this organization, the amazing people, Zach, that I've gotten a chance to meet over the, the duration of those 27 years and, and uh, really happy with what we've been able to do with this museum. Very good, very good. Now, now tell me a little bit about how the museum itself has evolved. You know, you're look, you, you're, your building looks amazing. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'm under, I, I think it's also uh, like a, a larger building with the, the jazz museum right. in there too, which I'm another yeah. big, I'm a big jazz fan too. Yeah. So that, that's another yeah. reason. That's another so, layer of my interest. 30, 30 years ago, it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> 30 years ago, we were in a one room office, guys, not nearly as big as my office here. And the office had a conference room table and guys like Buck O'Neill and a number of other local Negro leaders who were still with us. Sad to say, they're all gone now. They literally took turns paying the monthly rent wow. to keep that office open and with it, our hopes and dreams of one day building a facility that would pay rightful tribute, again, not to one of the great chapters in baseball history, but one of the greatest chapters in American history. And we started to chart a course for this museum. 30 years later, we are now recognized as America's National Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. It's been an amazing journey for a little museum that no one gave any chance of succeeding. Because you have to stop and think about where we were building this museum. Historic 18th and Vine. And Historic 18th and Vine in its heyday was as recognized street cross section as there was anywhere in the world because you had this intrinsic mixture of jazz and baseball radiating from this one street corner. I'm nearly at, my office is almost at the corner of 18th and Vine. It was jumping. But like a lot of urban areas, it had died. And, and truthfully, you can trace the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues with the rise and fall of many of those urban communities. Wherever you had successful Black baseball, you had thriving Black economies. And, and so this area had been left abandoned. And so here comes the Negro Leagues Museum saying, we're going to build a museum in an area that was depressed, was left, you know, to die. And so even our most ardent supporters were so cautious. They were saying, don't do it. Don't build here. Who's going to come see you? There's no built-in foot traffic. And thanks to the infinite wisdom of Buck O'Neill, who said, this is where we will build this museum. The origins of this story began right here in this neighborhood. And by building this museum here, we will resurrect historic 18th and Vine. That was 1990, 30 years later, people are living, working and playing at 18th and Vine again. And, and like I said, we haven't looked back and it is with great pride to see this little old museum recognized now as America's National Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and to see this community, you know, with life in it again. And honestly, I don't think it would have happened had we not made that cognizant decision to anchor it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so I'm gonna have to turn off somebody's uh, video here. All right, so somebody just popped up on their video and didn't have themselves muted. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm looking, you know, I was looking at your website and the history of the league started just what, a few blocks away where they were founded, oh, wow. literally just, you're within like baseball oh, throwing oh, distance oh, of the absolutely. founding. Absolutely. Yeah, no, the, the leagues were formed here in Kansas City 100 years ago, right around the corner from where we now operate, the old Paseo YMCA. The building still stands. Some of you may be aware that we're on the verge of saving that old historic landmark to convert it into an education and research center in memory of the late great Buck O'Neill. 
and in essence go full circle right back to the very building that gave birth to the story that we're now charged with preserving. But it all started right here 100 years ago when Andrew Root Foster would lead a contingent of eight independent black baseball team owners. They meet at the Paseo YMCA and out of that meeting came the birth of the Negro National League, the first successful organized black baseball league. The Negro Leagues then would go on to operate remarkably for 40 years from 1920 until 1960. And, and as you all could well imagine, that surprises most of the visitors who come to see us because most of them just easily relate the fact that Jackie Robinson breaks baseball's color barrier in 1947. And I do think the natural assumption is if Jackie breaks color barrier in 1947, if there was a Negro Leagues, surely it must have ended in and around that time. Well, the leagues would operate another 12, 13 years. Why? Because it took Major League Baseball 12 years before every Major League team had at least one Black baseball player. The Boston Red Sox would become the last team to integrate when they signed a guy who's not too far from you guys. He was in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. Elijah Pumpsy Green. Yeah, Elijah Pumpsy Green would be the last guy to sign and, and, and complete the integration cycle 12 years after Jackie breaks the color barrier. By 1960, the Negro League ceased operations because by then the best young black stars had moved into the major leagues or into their minor league system. So there was no replenishing system. So the leagues would then dissolve. Uh huh. But it all starts here in Kansas City, February 13th, 1920. And so on February 13th of this year, we go back into the Paseo YMCA. And the building is still being developed. And we go back in there to, uh, to commemorate 100 years of Negro Leagues baseball and then jet, jettison this year-long centennial celebration. And so, guys, we go in and we got an all-star delegation of distinguished guests joining me for this commemoration. So we've got Commissioner of Major League Baseball, Rob Manfred, and Xavier James, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Major League Baseball's Players Association, the Honorable Quentin Lucas, Mayor of the Great City of Kansas City, Kansas City Royals, legendary second baseman, eight-time gold glove winner, and now Jackson County Executive Frank White is there. The new owner of the Kansas City Royals, John Sherman, is there. The Lieutenant Governor of the State of Missouri, Mike Kehoe, is there. And so we go back in, we have this wonderful celebration to commemorate. We announce our year-long plans. Major League Baseball and the Players Association announced a joint $1 million contribution in support of the museum and the centennial celebration. We announce our plans to do a, a national day of recognition of Major League Baseball wide going to end the year with a big national star-studded gala. So we're off and running. Yeah, we get off to a flying start. And then 30 days later, everything comes to a screeching halt. Just like that. Just like that. And, and y'all, I ain't lying. I would be lying if I told you it didn't knock the wind out of my sails because it did. We had put so much into the planning process, and this was going to be such an important year for this museum. It was going to be the springboard for a major fundraising campaign, because as much work as we've done with this museum over the 30 years, there's still not an endowment in place. And as you all know, most museums start with some seed money already in place. We like to say that we started with a hope and a prayer. And so this was going to be that opportunity to set the stage for perpetual growth for our organization because we're going to have a captive audience in and around this 100th anniversary. And then to see that start to crumble as this pandemic grew in scope and magnitude. 
And it, it was absolutely disheartening. We were closed for three months, from March 14th to June 16th. And, and June 15th was my birthday. So I guess that was my birthday gift to myself the day we opened it the very next day. <laughs> and, and, and I was telling the story the other day, the very first visitor after we reopened, as fate would have it, was from Brooklyn, New York, of all places. And she and her husband were on their way to Denver, but they were stopping in Kansas City to do some work. And I ain't lying, y'all. When she walked in and bought a ticket to the Negro Leagues Museum, it was like a publisher's clearinghouse moment for me. I wanted the balloons and the confetti to be released, everything except a check. Now, I didn't have a check for it, but <laughs> I was so happy to see her because we had life back in this museum. Three long months of darkness. And I would come to the office. My staff would come in maybe once a week to help with mail orders, online orders. And, and I would come in three or four times a week, but I could never step foot in the gallery. I just could not do it. This museum is about keeping alive the legacy of those who, as I like to say, forged a glorious history in the midst of an inglorious time in American history. And it was lifeless. Yeah, and it was lifeless. And so it was challenging. It really was. But as I also share, if you're going to be a steward of this story, <laughs> you cannot wallow in self-pity. You can't do it you would be doing a tremendous injustice for all of those who call the Negro Leagues home. Because those players never cried about the social injustice. They went out and did something about it. You won't let me play with you, I create my own. And, and so I had to embody that spirit and I had to lead with that spirit so that my staff would come along with me. And, and, and that's what we've tried to do. And so I am so proud of how we've been able to salvage so much of this centennial celebration and keep it relevant and keep the museum on top of people's minds, even if it's in the midst of a doggone coronavirus pandemic. As I told somebody recently, to use a bad baseball analogy, Zach, coronavirus <laughs> was that big, nasty right-hander who just threw one high and tight and knocked <laughs> it down. And so now you got to get back up and dust yourself off and figure out how you're going to hit this sucker. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do. So we launched efforts like the Tip Your Cap to the Negro Leagues campaign. And the you know when baseball did come back, we rescheduled our national day of recognition for August 16th. And man, it filled me, my heart swelled with pride to see Negro League's history trending on August 16th and the museum trending on social media. And I go back to something, back to 1993 when I met Buck O'Neill. And I asked him then, well, Buck, what motivated you to want to build a Negro League's museum? You know what he said to me? He said, because I want us to be remembered so that we will be remembered. And man, they were being remembered on August 16th at a level in which I don't think Buck could have ever envisioned. And so as I was doing countless interviews that day, I think I had a 17 hour day and it was just <laughs> filled with one interview after another. Uh, I think I'm still feeling the effects of that, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm also still basking in the glow of that as well. So it's been special. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you got a, a pretty big day coming up. We were talking before uh, folks joined from the waiting room, a uh, pretty big day tomorrow. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, you know, each year the Royals do their own salute to the Negro Leagues. While it was great to see Major League Baseball have this National Day of Recognition, teams like the Kansas City Royals, Detroit Tigers, Pittsburgh Pirates, Milwaukee Brewers, where they've had Negro Leagues history, They've always done their own salute to the Negro Leagues. And, and of course, we do one of the largest ones in baseball here in Kansas City. And so tomorrow is our rescheduled salute to the Negro Leagues. And yet we won't have fans in the stands, so that'll be a little different. But it won't take away from the pageantry of the, of the game and 
the, the Royals will be wearing the 1945 Kansas City Monarch uniforms. They're playing the St. Louis Cardinals, who will be in the 1930 St. Louis Stars uniform. And, and that old Stars team was pretty good. That 1930 Stars team had Cool Papa Bell, Mule Suttles, Willie Wells. Uh, it was an outstanding team. Had a second tier guy, second tier group of guys led by Leroy Matlock, who was a tremendous pitcher. The great Ted Double Duty Ratcliffe, who, in my opinion, should be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And, and so that was a great team in 1930. The 1945 team is significant for one very special reason. In 1945, a guy by the name of Jack Roosevelt Robinson was signed by the Kansas City Monarchs. And he would spend one season here playing for the Monarchs, 1945. And y'all, the year that he spent in Kansas City, he fell in love with everything that Kansas City is known for, barbecue and jazz. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and really, by the end of the 45 season, he had disappeared. His teammates had no idea where he had gone. Jackie had made the East-West All-Star game. And it would be in Chicago where the Dodgers scouts, Claude Sukfort, would meet him in Chicago and whisk him off to Brooklyn, where he was to meet with Branch Rickey. Robinson really did not know what he was walking into. As a matter of fact, he thought Ricky was creating his own version of a Negro League. He was going to pay a little bit more money. And it was only once he arrived at Ricky's office was it sprung on him that he was going to be the chosen one to break baseball's nearly six-decade-long self-imposed color barrier. And what's even more, more remarkable about that story, Zach, is that this takes place in a span of about three hours where two very strong-willed individuals come to one accord because Jackie Robinson had to put his faith in a white man he just laid eyes on that he wasn't going to be left out there hung to dry. Uh -huh. and, and Branch Rickey had to trust that Jackie Robinson, who was a natural born fighter, wouldn't fight back. If you all remember or recall, Jackie Robinson had been nearly court-martialed from the U.S. Army for refusing to give up his seat on the bus to a white officer. So he was a natural born fighter. Or as Buck O'Neill would say, Jackie could duke and would duke. He'd knock you on your rump. So Ricky had to trust that he wouldn't fight back. And in a, in a span of three hours, these two very strong willed individuals came to one accord and it literally changed the course of American history. As I tell people all the time, I don't know if you believe in divine intervention, but there was something extremely divine that took place in that room and it changed the course of American history. And of course, it was legendary Kansas City Monarch Hilton Smith, Hall of Fame pitcher for the Monarchs, who actually saw Jackie playing at Fort Hood and suggested that J.L. Wilkinson give him a tryout. Little did J.L. Wilkinson know he was signing the man that was going to put him out of business. Yeah, it's an interesting twist of fate, so to speak. And, but you know, the other side of the equation, had it not been for World War II, Jackie doesn't get invited to join the Monarch. They were too good. They were too good. <laughs> But the Monarchs roster had been decimated by World War II. So the great Buck O'Neill is serving in the Navy. Hank Thompson, who would integrate two Major League teams. Henry Thompson would integrate the St. Louis Browns in the, yeah, in the American League and, and the New York Giants in the National League. He's there before Willie Mays gets there and before Monty Irvin gets there. Hank Thompson was an outstanding player, and had it not been for his personal demons, he likely would have been a Hall of Fame caliber ball player. He's serving in the Army. Hall of Famer Willard Brown. Josh Gibson nicknamed him Home Run Brown. Now, if Gibson nicknamed you Home Run Brown, <laughs> you must have some power. 
And, and Willard Brown was also in, in the Army. A guy named Ted Strong. Ted Strong, if you want to draw a comparison, Ted, think Dave Winfield. Ted Strong was six feet six, six, seven, freakish athlete, played every position except for pitcher and catcher. He's a six, seven shortstop, starred for the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah, and that's the kind of athlete he was. He's in the Army. So if the Monarchs have their full contingent of players, there's no way Jackie gets invited to play for the Monarchs. And how would history have been altered? Yeah, you got to think that they'd have broke the color barrier at some point in time. And, and, and many thought Monty Irvin should have been the guy to break the color barrier. Matter of fact, he was the owner's choice to break the color, if the color barrier is going to get broken. I have to remind people all the time, it wasn't like Negro League owners were just out there waiting for the integration of this game. This was their business. You know, they yeah. made a successful business. So they're not out there advocating for the integration of baseball. Fans wanted to see this, though. Yeah, fans wanted to see this. And, and so, yeah, it's an interesting kind of byproduct of what occurred because Robinson's breaking up the color barrier, put Negro Leagues out of business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, that's a long way of telling you they're playing in 1945 uniforms. <laughs> tomorrow and, and both sets of game worn uniforms are going to be auctioned off with the proceeds coming back to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. So if you guys are interested in, in game worn product, you know, please make sure you follow the Royals uh, website and, and you can learn how to place your bid on some of those game worn items uh, from tomorrow's night game between the Kansas City Monarchs and the St. Louis Stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of, uh, you know, Robinson with his uh, time in the Monarchs, obviously, recently there was some news that you received uh, regarding a, a particular piece of uh, memorabilia you have in the uh, museum, um, which which Chadwick Bossman's um, uniform. And yeah, obviously yeah. The, the news which, you know, made me aware of that is, is, is you know, sad news. Yeah, but it, it is. Uh, it is because it, I, I'll be honest, guys, it's been a very difficult stretch, you know, over the last couple of weeks because we lost Chad Bozeman, sadly, at, at 43 years old. And, and of course, he beautifully portrays Jackie Robinson in the film 42. And we spent two glorious days with him here in Kansas City when we hosted the second largest screening of the film, only behind L.A. But in Hollywood, they get to do that all the time. In Kansas City, we don't get to do it. And, and so we had this huge red carpet screening. And so Chadwick is here. Harrison Ford, who was brilliant as Branch Rickey, he should have won a, a, an Academy Award for his portrayal of Branch Rickey. And, and, and Andre Holland, who played the reporter Wendell Smith, uh, very underrated actor. They're all here for our red carpet screening. And I tell this story all the time. I'm from Crawfordville, Georgia. Now, Crawfordville, Georgia is a town of about 500. Yeah, <laughs> it's about 80 miles east of Atlanta, about 50 miles west of Augusta. And this was my first time on the red carpet. And y'all, I milked the carpet for everything I could get <laughs> out of it. I went up the carpet. I went back down the carpet. I went back up the carpet again because I didn't know if I'm going to get back on the carpet ever again. So I got everything I could get out of it. But it was on the red carpet that Chadwick and Harrison Ford along with Thomas Toll, who at that time owned Legendary Film, who produced the film, presented me with the Kansas City Monarch, 1945 road Kansas City Monarch uniform that Chadwick wore in the film. And, and of course, that jersey and cap hangs proudly inside the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And, and so it saddens me that we lost this amazingly talented young man at 43 who breakout role was this iconic figure in Jackie Robinson. 
and yet he becomes an icon because of the way he portrayed Robinson. And then, of course, James Brown and Thurgood Marshall, and then he becomes the Black Panther. You know, this unlikely African-American superhero. And, and, and so, yeah, we, we will fondly remember him. And, and I couldn't be more happy to have that, that jersey and cap hanging inside the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Then we lose Tom Seaver, who as a kid was my favorite pitcher as a kid. Don't know what it was that drew me to Tom Seaver. And I'm in Georgia, and I'm an Atlanta Braves fan. But there was something <laughs> about Tom Terrific. And, and, and he seemed like he just put every ounce of energy in every pitch. And, and I fell in love with Tom Seaver. And then we lose coach John Thompson over at Georgetown, who was a dear friend of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, a great friend of Buck O'Neill. I got to spend a number of days just listening to Coach Thompson and Buck O'Neill talk to one another and trade stories. And they were both tremendous leaders of men. And, and then we lose my friend Lou Brock. And, and some of you may be aware that it was Buck O'Neill who signed Lou Brock to his first professional contract to the Chicago Cubs. A lot of people forget that Lou's career began in the Cubs, with the Cubs, and, and because he was, he was traded in one of the worst trades in baseball history, as it turns out. He's traded for a hurt arm pitcher named Ernie Brolio, who sadly passed away last year. It wasn't a bad trade initially, but Brolio was damaged good. Brolio had won 18 one year and 21 year. And, and so the Cubs had a pretty crowded outfield. Lou was struggling with that sun outfield in Chicago. And, and so the Cubs, out of a courtesy, come to Buck O'Neill and they say, Buck, we want to trade Lou for Ernie Brolio. What do you think? Now, Buck being the company man that he was, and he says, I think that's a good deal. He never really did. But he knew it was going to be the <laughs> opportunity for Lou to play every day. And the Cubs were not using Lou really the way that they should have. You got this thoroughbred, and you won't turn him loose. Well, they send him to St. Louis. And if you recall, the Cardinals were 10 games back behind Philadelphia. And they take off with Lou. And they never stopped running with Lou. And, and, and so I, I uh, was honored, obviously, to speak at his funeral services uh, almost two weeks ago, this coming Saturday, in St. Louis. And I reminded folks that <laughs> Lou committed larceny 938 times and was welcomed into heaven. <laughs> and so that gives great hope that I might get a chance to get there. Because if he can steal that much, there's, a, there's still hope for me to make it as well. And, you know, my heart, my heart uh, certainly uh, is saddened okay. to lose Lou. He was a surrogate son of Buck. And, and I got to meet Lou and Ernie Banks. Of course, Buck signed Ernie Banks as well. And he signed Lee Arthur Smith and Joe Carter to their first professional contract. So needless to say, old Buck had a pretty good eye when it came to talent and Lou was his son. And so so those two weeks of those two weeks stretch, man, was very difficult for me and all of us here at the Negro Leagues Museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, obviously the, the museum's fairly far away from us, but we do want to be supportive as possible. What are some of the things that we can do here in California? I know there are some folks, uh, all throughout the country, but most of us are, you know, based in California. What can we do some, you know, to support you? I know that there's a few, yeah, like an art show fundraiser, the uh, well, streetcar campaign. Yeah, Tell yeah. us about some of the things that we can support you on. Well, you know, first and foremost, we always appreciate the consideration of those becoming members of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. For me, membership is like becoming a shareholder. And I don't know if there's a greater way to support an organization like ours than becoming a member. 
where you say, I'm going to make a yearly commitment to this organization. And y'all, we've got folks who are members of this museum who will never step foot inside this museum, but they understand that the legacy of the Negro Leagues must play on. Uh -huh. and, and so they support in that manner. We certainly hope that your travels, once this coronavirus pandemic goes away, will bring you to Kansas City so you can experience the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. We have our online gift store so you can shop and get your Negro Leagues gear, which supports the museum as well. And so there, and, and what we're doing tonight, this kind of advocacy that is introducing the museum to people uh, is always welcome. So there are any number of ways in which we can continue to support this great organization. And, and we encourage everybody to join our efforts oh. to keep the legacy of the Negro Leagues alive. Um, so, in uh, you know, want to make sure that we have opportunity for some folks to uh, ask some questions here. Um, you know, if you do have any questions, I'm showing there's a lot in the chat. So um, instead of sorting through that, if you do have something, <laughs> if you could retype that, because I do, I'm noticing a lot of things in here, not necessarily questions, but uh, if you're able to um, um, put your uh, question in the chat, or you could also raise your hand. And what I would do then is, uh, you could just turn on your video and you could ask uh, Bob a question that way. Yeah, I just saw someone mention Johnny Wright and he is one of those guys that is not very well known, but he was a pioneer as well because he's there with Jackie in Montreal playing for the Montreal Royals. And, and Johnny Wright, unfortunately, never really got a fair shake. Uh, and so Johnny Wright was an outstanding pitcher in, in the Negro Leagues. And, you know, not too many people know that name. And so I had an opportunity here recently to talk to his daughter. And it was an honor to do so as we reflected on just how special an individual and ball player Johnny Wright was. And it's unfortunate that he didn't really get the opportunity uh, for Major League Baseball to see the real Johnny Wright. Yeah, he, he was an outstanding pitcher. Um, so obviously, you know, 2020 plans did not necessarily go as you expected. Um, are there any uh, plans uh, in the works? Um, obviously, we're not, you know, in the, uh, you know, still in the thick of things. But uh, in the future to, you know, to celebrate that centennial in 2021. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. no, we absolutely will. And so we had made the decision to roll over our big events into 2021. And all while we found ways to keep the celebration going this year, because it, it's still a tremendous milestone with 100, 100 years of, of the birth of the Negro League, we knew that we would roll over the major events into 2021 and hope for the best. You know, you hope that this pandemic becomes a thing of the past. And, and, and I think you guys will be interested in, in what our campaign is going to be next year is essentially called Negro Leagues 101. And for any of us who step foot on a college campus, the 101 courses were the only ones that I passed. You know, those were the ones that bumped up my GPA. And so we're going to create an educational initiative that will hopefully introduce, you know, facts and relative information about the Negro Leagues to as many as we can. We've got two virtual reality projects that are in the works. And any number of projects, including a traveling exhibition that we're building around uh, the Barrier Breakers. We installed a new exhibit this year called Barrier Breakers. And, and again, it chronicles all the players who broke their respective major league teams color barrier, as we so typically do in our society. We always celebrate the first. We never remember the second. And man, if you're number 16, you can pretty much forget about it. They deserve to be more than just footnote in baseball in American history. Larry Doby would integrate the American League three months after Jackie breaks the color barrier in the National League. And it's really only been over the last decade that people have really started to pay proper respect 
to Larry Doby's pioneering role. And, and, and so fewer folks know that there were five guys who go to the major leagues in 1947. You know, they're the answers to a trivia question. So yeah, most people know Jackie and a few more know Larry Doby. But as I mentioned earlier, Henry Thompson would, would break the color barrier with the St. Louis Browns that same year. His Kansas City Monarch teammate, Willard Brown, would follow him to the St. Louis Browns. And, and of course, Dan Bankhead would become the answer to another great trivia question. Who was the first black pitcher in the major league? Most assumed that it was Satchel. Yeah, but Satchel gets there the following year. It was a hard-throwing pitcher named Dan Bankhead, who comes from a long line of Bankhead brothers who were great ball players, but Bankhead could never harness his control when he got to the major leagues. Buck O'Neill always surmised that Dan Bankhead, who was from Alabama, was afraid of what the repercussions might be if he hit a white batter. And he just could not harness his control and I don't care how hard you throw. If you can't get guys off the plate, you're not going to have a whole lot of success unless you satchel pay. Now, satchel is a, satchel is a different story now. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but yeah, those five guys go. And so we look at all of those players who broke their respective major league teams' color barrier and, and, and bring their stories to life. Mm hmm mm hmm and um, do you have a few people that uh, um, uh, brought up uh, women who had played in the leagues? Um, tell us about it. You know some of those uh, some of those uh, some, some of those stories of the. Oh yeah, no, I mean you had three pioneering women: Tony Stone, Connie Morgan, Mamie Peanut Johnson. Tony Stone, of course, uh, would eventually settle there in the Bay Area, uh, where she passed away. And they were pioneers, women who competed with and against the men in the 1950s, with Tony Stone being the first. Tony Stone would take the roster place of a ball player that you probably heard his name before, Henry Aaron. <laughs> yeah, the, the Braves, the Boston Braves had signed Henry Aaron away from the Indianapolis Clowns after the 1952 season. And the Clowns would replace him with Tony Stone. And then she would be followed by Mamie Peanut Johnson and then eventually Connie Morgan, three tremendously gifted athletes uh, who competed with and against the men in the 1950s. Even more so, there were female owners and executives in the Negro Leagues, most notably Effa Manley. Effa Manley would become the first woman really to own and operate a professional baseball team. She and her husband, Abe, owned the Newark Eagles, but it was Mrs. Manley who ran legitimately the day-to-day -day operations of that baseball team. And she knew the business of baseball as well as any man. Had tremendous talent play for her. My dear friend, the late, great Monty Irvin, Larry Doby, Leon Day, Willie Wells, all played for Effa Manley's Newark Eagles all in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. The late, great Don Newcomb should be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. They all played for Effa Manley's Newark Eagles. She's the first woman to be nominated and inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And as I share with our guests, it strikes me, guys, that a league born out of segregation would become the driving force for social change in this country a league born out of exclusion would become perhaps this country's most inclusive entity. You see, they didn't care what color you were and they didn't care what gender you were. Can you play? Do you <laughs> have something to offer? And really that's the way that it should be. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and in, so, in so many respects, the Negro Leagues is represented everything that America is supposed to be. She's not there yet. And because she's not yet there yet, that doesn't mean that she's not the greatest country in the world. It just means that there's still work left to be done. And, and it's our job 
to do that. And it's the job of our children who will come after us to do that, to continue to challenge her to be as great as she possibly can, because that's exactly what we should be doing as individuals. We're always striving to be better. Uh huh. And, and so the Negro Leagues embodies that spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I have a tough question. <laughs> what would be your centennial team? Ooh, man. That is a tough question because it's so many great. Ones. We'll, we'll give you like 12 but, players. You could, you could go over. But, nine. you know, I tell you what, <laughs> it, it, it is highly represented on our field of legends. So if we're going position by position, I would go first base to great Buck Leonard. I think second base, Newt Allen, who's not in the Hall of Fame, but Buck O'Neill thought Newt Allen was a first ballot Hall of Famer and should be in the Hall of Fame. At shortstop, I think you got to take John Henry Pop Lloyd, uh, who was tremendous. And, and third base, Ray Dandridge. My outfield would be, and this is where it gets tough, cool, <laughs> cool Papa Bell, Oscar Charleston, and I think Turkey Stearns, although I want to put Monty in that group as well because he was so good. I wish Major League Baseball had gotten Monty Irvin when he was 20, 21 years old. There was nothing Monty Irvin could not do on a baseball field. But the gobbler, Turkey Stearns, was as good as they get. Cool Papa Bell says, if Turkey Stearns is not in the Hall of Fame, there is no Hall of Fame. That's how <laughs> good the gobbler was. And, and, and so, you know, and, and, and then my catcher, my catcher got to be Josh, Josh Gibson. Yeah, and if I get a second catcher, Biz Mackey, uh, who taught a young Roy Campanella how to catch. Biz Mackey may be the greatest defensive catcher this game has ever seen. Gibson is the greatest combination of defense and offense, bar none, bar none. And, and, and then my pitching staff would be Satchel Page, Bullet Rogan, Leon Day, uh, that, that, that's a pretty good one. And, and the great, my utility player would be Martin DeHigo, who played, right. he could fill in in every position. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you did well on that. I was, uh, I thought, you, you know, that was a, that's a challenging one. We got to, you know. Because I just left out a bunch of guys who would be just as good. <laughs> Absolutely. You think about this team, and I didn't even mention Willie Mays or Henry Aaron or Ernie Banks, you know, because they were in the Negro Leagues, but they were young stars in the Negro Leagues who eventually became big stars in the Major Leagues. But what I remind folks all the time, if you stop today and you pose the question, who are the two greatest living Major Leaguers today? And I don't think you'll get much argument, much debate. Willie Mays, and Henry Aaron. Both of them come out of the Negro League. Yeah, that's how much talent was there in the Negro League. And guys, when I hear someone who I had the utmost respect for, my dear friend Monty Irvin, when I hear Monty Irvin say, I played with Willie Mays, and he did. He was Willie's mentor. He, he took care of, of Willie when he joined the Giants. And I played against Henry Aaron, and neither of them are Josh Gibson. That just makes you wonder, damn, how good was Josh Gibson? Yeah. You know, and, 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 and as Buck would say, he was better than that. You know, Gibson was incredible. And, and to think that mainstream baseball missed these legendary plays and how much better our game would have been had the doors opened sooner, if the doors opened before 1947. Because I, as I tell my guests, man, they didn't learn how to play baseball after 1947. 
they were playing great baseball well before 1947. Had the doors open sooner, the record books would be entirely different. There's no question about that. But our game would have been so much better because if we don't get Jackie in 1947, Zach, and if it's 20 years later that baseball finally integrates, you think about all the great stars we would have missed. We'd have missed Willie Mays. We'd have missed Henry Aaron. We'd have missed Ernie Banks and Roy Campanella. We likely would have missed Bob Gibson and Roberto Clemente. Can you imagine our sport without those great stars? And if you can, you can imagine what it was like before 1947. Yeah. And, and, and so as baseball fans, we were absolutely cheated. We should have seen all the great stars take the field with and against one another to compete. Instead, we were relegated to having two very professional leagues. One we know everything about, or we've got a place to turn to learn about it the major leagues, the other, the Negro leagues, which did the exact same thing. It gave the best black and Hispanic baseball players an opportunity to showcase their world-class baseball abilities. But unfortunately, very few folks know anything about this league known as the Negro League. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I really appreciate what you're doing to keep the history alive and Again, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. Um, definitely wish the centennial plans were going a little bit different for you. But I'm excited to watch some MLB Network tomorrow night and see uh, what transpires out of Kansas City's game. Yeah, it, should, it, should, it should be fun. And I'm, I'm excited to go back out to the ballpark for the first time and uh, do a little TV work for the Cardinals and do a little TV work for the Royals and radio work kind of promote what's going on. And like I said, the, the game-worn uniforms will be auctioned off. So please consider make, you know, bidding on those. But all the proceeds, every dime raised, will come back in support of the Negro League Baseball Museum. Very good. Well, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. Bob, uh, thank you very much. Definitely wish you the best in every endeavor. Look forward to keeping in touch. And... Uh, for some of you that may have joined late or uh, want to uh, watch this in the future, I'll make sure that this is posted um, on YouTube within the next couple of days and send out the link. I'll also send out the link uh, for the museum and ways in which uh, we can donate um, and uh, keep the history alive um, for the Great League. So again, Bob, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for joining us and have a great night. All right, guys, thank you all so much.